delicious. Hi, Tom Spellman with Dave Wilson Nursery. Now I'm Phil Purcell with Dave Wilson Nursery. We're here in Irvine, California this morning looking at a project that I started back in March of 2013. So this project has been in the ground about two and a half years now and it is a trial of apple varieties that are all high chill varieties. They're all varieties that are rated between 1,000 and 500 chill hours. So here in Irvine, California, the last two years in a row, we've had considerably less than 100 hours each year. So theoretically, none of these apple varieties should be producing fruit here at all. Originally when the trial was put in, in 2013, I planted 30 different varieties, two trees of each, everything on Mollings 111 rootstock, just to, to give it a trial and see what, what happened with these varieties in this area. Now, one of the things that I have noted over the years in dealing with California rare fruit growers and other growers in California that didn't realize that they were actually thinking they were planting the wrong varieties was this is not a, a good area for high chill apples, but people kept telling me, I'm getting Arkansas Black, I'm getting King Tompkins, I'm getting Brayburns, I'm getting all these varieties that are high chill rated that are producing fruit here in Orange County, California with little or no chill. So the main focus of the trial was to determine whether or not that's true, whether or not these varieties are actually producing fruit. Well, with 30 varieties and three others that were top grafted into the collection, so 33 varieties total, now two and a half years in the ground, I have fruit on 27 varieties this year. So what we're, what we're thinking is that there are very few apples that are really anywhere close to high chill. And the quality's been pretty good, the color's been pretty good. Um, after two and a half years, I'm really happy with this project. So we'll probably go through in, a, in another, maybe, maybe next fall, maybe the fall after, and kind of write up a report on the varieties that did the best, where the best production came from, where the best quality and best flavor came from. But, Let's, uh, let's take a look at a couple of the varieties here that I think are standouts. This is a variety called King Tompkins. It's, a, it's an old antique apple variety. It's rated at like seven or 800 chill hours. Our accumulation this year, like I said, was really low. It was probably around 50 chill hours at best. And you know, it's produced a nice crop. We've already harvested quite a bit off it. It still has some nice late bloom fruit off it. The quality was good. Theoretically, shouldn't be producing fruit in this area at all. But. Yeah, so what's, I think what's really important is, at least up in Northern California, or you have the same thing here. People are always afraid of apples. Well, the chill hours are too high. And you know, I try to tell people, well, don't let the chill hours really throw you a loop, especially when it comes to apples, because you know, down along the coast in Northern California, they don't get a lot of chill, but you know, it's, it's a big apple growing region. Sure, so. look at that Wat Watsonville area, Absolutely. you know, has been really popular. That Sonoma area has been real popular. They're getting apple varieties all over in areas where they probably even shouldn't right. up there, theoretically. Yeah. But. So, you know, this study that you're doing right here, which just kind of helps you know, everyone to understand you can have apples in low chill area. You can have really good variety of apples. It just doesn't have to be the quote unquote low chill apples. Absolutely. I mean, everybody grows Anna and Dorset Golden and some people stick their neck out and they'll grow Fujis or Galas or Pink Ladies. But And those varieties all do fine. They do yeah. very well. But what we really wanted to do here was show people that you've got lots of other options. There, yeah. there are so many varieties that are going to be productive and going to be good quality here yeah. in Southern California with virtually no chill at all. So also, there's been this review revitalization for antique apples, for cider apples, and I think most people th are thinking, well, you know, unless I live in the Midwest or whatever, I, I can't handle those, but they want those varieties. Now, Absolutely. You know, like this, this is an old antique variety that, you know, will work in, I mean, 50 chill hours, and it's producing plenty of fruit, especially Absolutely. on a two-year tree. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, this is only, you know, this is only two and a half years in the ground. Yeah. So it's really only second leaf on this tree from planting time. All right, let's look at a couple of others. Phil, this one's uh, Brayburn. And, you know, Brayburn has uh, been rated right around 500 or 600 chill hours. And uh, I would have to say this is one of the shining stars of the whole project here. You know, the, the color's nice. The, uh, the flavor's really good. That crisp. That's something you would never expect to get out of this right. apple in Orange County, Southern California, but nice piece of fruit. And again, the tree's just done incredibly well. Good fruit set. I mean, there were, you know, we've already picked 
many fruit off this tree. There's at least another hundred fruit on the tree still. Yeah. And you know, again, two and a half years. It's, it's, unbelievable. Yeah. It, so Tom, what variety is this? Well, when I when I set the project up, I wanted to incorporate as, as many varieties as I could. So I thought I'm going to incorporate the two columnar varieties. Okay, so this is one of the. New this columnar. is this is Scarlet Sentinel, and um, they were actually it, it's not quite as columnar as I'd like it to be right now, but you can see how it's just producing off of these these main scaffolding right. branches. Right. Um, but we we did top all these when they were put in, so it's a little more of a headed tree than you would normally see this grown as but you know look at the crop on it i mean it's just fantastic it's yeah it's loaded with fruit it's going to hang on for another two and a half or three months probably in, into winter season yeah and uh, the fruit's not bad i mean that we've eaten a few off here already the quality's not that bad these were all from a little bit later bloom and again 800 hour rated variety yeah you know? see, i know that you know up in the pacific northwest column apples are really popular so my assumption was, you know, Northern California, they do well, but yeah. I mean, look at the fruits that you're getting on, on the system. Yeah, I, I was just really impressed with, with this variety and the North Pole actually, ha for uh, the trees of the same age, hasn't grown quite as well and hasn't set as much fruit, but they all still set fruit this year. So yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really been fun to try all these. Yeah. Now we were talking about um, some cider varieties before and one of the varieties that we incorporated in was um, Gravenstein. And they've done incredibly well. I mean, you're sure. getting nice set, you're getting... And, and I think one of the things that I like about this project, as opposed to what a commercial apple grower would want, these bloomed for a fairly long period of time. So you've got everything from ripe fruit down to small fruit. So if I was a commercial apple grower, I wouldn't want this. Right. This wouldn't work. I want to come in and pick all my fruit at once. Yeah. As a backyard tree grower, this is perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. I'm going to get a little bit this week, a little bit next week. I'm, I'm going to pick off this tree for a month and a half. Right. Yeah. So, and you know. It's, a, it's a, almost like its own successive ripening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tree. Successive ripening on its own. And for an old, you know, old fashioned variety like this, that's been, it's been a popular commercial variety. It's used for juices. It's used for ciders. And you know, here it is in, in Irvine, California, just with a nice load of fruit on a very young, young tree. Yeah. Okay, so this one is um, a, an old, old English variety. It's Cox Orange Pippin. Okay. And uh, again, rated it at like 700 to 800 chill hours. And I think some people actually even rate it higher than that. Yeah. And uh, nice, nice fruit set. Fruit's not gigantic, but it's uh, it's tasty. It has a really nice, you know, crispy, crunchy flavor. And I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed with the amount of fruit that we're getting off these young trees. Um, so this, again, this you is, got, you know, a, a, a nice, unique, antique variety that you would never think that you can have down here in Southern California. You wouldn't even consider it. And here you are. It's no, you know, I, like crazy. I bet in my whole, my whole career with Dave Wilson nursery, I probably haven't sold 50 of these in Southern California, yeah. you know, and, and here it is a variety that's, that nobody's ever really trialed or really had uh, any appreciation for that. You can get a nice set off of good quality apples. Well, don't sell too many of them. I'd like to keep them. <laughs> <laughs> A uh, couple questions. First is, so is this disease on this apple right here? Phil, this is um, another one of our antique varieties called Ashmead's Kernel. Okay. And it's a russeted apple. So this is pretty typical for okay. the way the, the exterior looks. It kind of has that, that kind of a sandy feel to it and a kind of a you know that pebbly sandy texture right. to um, the way that it looks. But I'll tell you what. That's natural. That's natural. Okay. And this has been Let's see if I can do this without don't cut me. Let's see if I can do it without hurting myself or you. Super crisp, not mealy. Wow. Oh, I could tell this would be a really good cider apple too. Absolutely. It's kind of a nice sprightly flavor, but it, you know the sugar level is pretty high. It's really, it's really it tasty. So the other question I had, and I noticed that you have placed these micro spray sprinklers right up on the uh, the trunk of the trees, and uh, I see this a lot in the Central Valley. The farmers are all going to it, as opposed to the regular. When people think of drip irrigation, they're just thinking of the little drip emitters. Right, right. Is that an efficient way? 
to uh, get to these apples? It's worked out really, really efficiently here. These throw a, a spray of about eight feet. Okay. So. We're, you know, we put them up close to the trunk to start. Right. They actually, the leader tubing goes out about two and a half or three feet into the main line, which is under the mulch. So we eventually had planned on moving these out. Right, okay. And probably adding another emitter. So we'll have an emitter on either side of the tree and move them out a little bit and then maybe go down to a, a three by three okay. pattern instead of the four sure. foot so pattern. You, so eventually as a drip line, as the drip line expands, as the trees become a little bit larger, we'll expand on the irrigation system. But this has worked incredibly well for now. And you can see that there's no lack of vigor on these trees. Right. I mean, uh, and I've actually asked them to cut back on the irrigation because, well, number one, water conservation is a big thing in California right now. We don't want to overwater anything. Right. And um, I, you know, they've, they've grown out incredibly well. So yeah. about a month and a half ago, I said, hey, let's cut that irrigation pattern in half and make sure that we're conserving water as best we can and i can try and slow these trees down a little bit right yeah so um that 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 uh that head has done really well so far um no. they, and we're also this this whole project this whole field station is all irrigated with reclaimed water okay so there's no there's no you know potable water coming in from the from the city lines it's all that you know reclaimed recycled well it seems like water. the apples you know, we went over, we saw some persimmons, and they're stressed a little bit with that water. Right. But these apples, I guess they're not very fussy. No salt burn, no problems, no no issues with these trees at all. I look at these trees about every two weeks just to make sure that uh, no problems come up that would ever get ahead of me. I'm, I'm, I'm paranoid out here about fire blight, although yeah. there isn't any fire blight in the area. I've, I've kind of scoped the whole area to see if there were any ornamental pears or, you know, old apples or anything around here that actually had fire blight. And the nice thing about this field station, it's really pretty isolated. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really found any other host plants in the area and uh, everything so far is, is clean. You know, I follow these during bloom period and, you know, six, eight, ten weeks after, you know, looking at them as often as I can. So far, no fire blight, no bacterial spot, no, uh, no, you know, issues. We had a little bit of aphid this spring. And when I came in about two weeks later, I had a beautiful hatch of, of ladybugs and they had totally demolished the whole okay. aphid population. Other so. question I have is down here, will these trees go completely dormant? And if not, does, does that really matter? That's a great question. The, the nice thing about these particular varieties, it seems like all of these supposed high chill varieties have a tendency to go into a pretty good hard dormancy down yeah. here. The varieties that I have trouble with down here are some of the low chill varieties. Anna, Dorset Golden, and Granny Smith okay. in particular, they don't want to go dormant. So we have to come in in, in early to mid-January because they bloom end of January, they'll start blooming down here. Yeah. So we have to come in early to mid-January and actually defoliate them. Okay. and get them to go dormant but so far the last two years in a row this project has gone dormant really well on its own yeah okay so tom since you're in such a low chill environment do you have any problems with you know with the, what's known as rogue bloom you know what phil absolutely we do and that's that again with my concern for fire blight rogue bloom is something that i've been um, trying to monitor as closely as possible uh, rogue bloom for those that don't understand it is bloom that comes totally in an off season so rogue bloom on apples typically comes in july august so something September. like this right here this is a great example right okay, here so the trees are so finished, uh you're producing fruit but now it wants to go ahead and bloom it's again. blooming again so not much this fact there's probably that's the only cluster on this tree but the issue with rogue bloom in southern california is if you have a fire blight host that's local and you get the, you know that bee activity between an infected plant and a non-infected plant fire blight will translocate very very easily this time of year so okay. i'm a big advocate of coming in and plucking off all those rogue blooms. I don't want any off-season bloom. I want to. I want my crop to bloom on time, and set it set. You know, a, a, a good uh, supply of fruit for the season, and anything else that comes in after that, I pick it off. Yeah, well, that's so, a good tip. Yeah, that that really really helps to eliminate the spread of fire blight. And most people don't realize that you'll get uh, off of a, a few rogue blooms on a tree as long as the weather conditions are right especially like now this, we've got humid. humidity today yeah. it's overcast it's only going to be in the high 70s today perfect time for for fire blight right. to translocate from one plant to another so yeah. you have to be just as careful 
for off-season bloom as you would for you know uh, in-season full bloom. That's because that's when most people think they're going to get fire blight is that early bloom. Exactly. When we get in the rains and such. So. Right. Right. And people, you know, typically don't pay attention to it this time of year. When yeah. they, they just on apples, pretty. they really, really should. Right. You don't, you don't want that late season bloom. Right. Now, as far as um, maintenance on this project, I've really been trying to keep it as low key as I can. I, I don't want to come in here and and really try and do something where I'm, you know, really giving these trees all the best possible care. I want to try and replicate something that could easily be done in a backyard. Yeah. So the only things that I'm really uh, critical about are, you, you know my opinion on mulching. Yep. And we haven't mulched the whole project, but we've mulched the center row uh, right after the project went in. Yeah, I'm planning on remulching the whole project this coming winter. Okay. And irrigation through the, through the hottest part of the summer has been about every 15 days. Now I don't think we've irrigated in over 20 days at this point. And you know, since we're get, starting to get some rain and some cooler temperatures, I've got plenty of growth on these trees for the season. I'm I'm going to hold back irrigation as much as I possibly can at this point. I want these trees to effectively go into a good hard dormancy again and the later you irrigate through the fall season or feeding through the fall season is very counterproductive to achieving dormancy in Southern California. Okay. So we're, we're going to almost force these into dormancy by restricting the water and no fertilization on these after the month of June. Okay. Like I mentioned before, the eventual plan on this project is to write a UC study. So I'll probably do that with one of the extension agents here, my good friend John Kabashima. Your friend John Kabashima was involved in helping me to set up this project and uh, I, would, I would be honored to be able to write the paper with him. And um, I think he, when we originally planned the project, he gave me kind of a strange look saying, you know, you want to do what high chill apples in orange well, county I was, and i was thinking the same thing yeah yeah and and uh but I'd, I'd heard so many positive reports on how well the varieties did you know and then john said well okay you know i'll, I'll back you on that we'll do it so uh probably this time next year or it may be two years from now depending on what our weather conditions and our fruit set is for the next couple of years we'll write the report evaluate the varieties do bricks tests and, and and sugar levels on the fruit itself and you know some quality uh evaluations on the fruit so that i'll be able to take each of these 33 varieties and determine what what's the best possible 10 or the best possible five if you want to grow some antique varieties or some high chill rated varieties in orange county these are going to be the shining stars so already what this has shown me is that i can go back to my my coastal towns up in Northern California, these people have been shying away from apples and let them know, Absolutely. you know what, look, do it. Don't worry about the chill hours because we know that apples are very adaptable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in a year when chill has been so marginal, the last two years in a row in Southern California, and uh, everybody's complaining about, you know, low production on, on some of the stone fruits and, and the, some of the palm fruits, but these apples just don't seem to be affected by it at all. Right. They've just come through it with, with shining colors, and I'm, I'm, I'm really enthused with this project, and I'm really looking forward to the next couple of years of evaluation. Yeah.